So today, the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is pleased to present Rose Buchanan and Rebecca Sharp from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Rose is an archive specialist and provides on and off site reference for records of civilian agencies, specializing in records related to Native Americans and to federal courts in the District of Columbia. Prior to joining the reference staff, Rose worked in NARA's Innovation Hub, assisting researchers in digitizing pre World War I military service and pension records. She earned her master's degree in public history uh, from North Carolina State University and her master's in library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Rebecca is an archive specialist and currently specializes in records of numerous civilian agencies, including the records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of the Census, Federal Courts, Immigration and Naturalization Service, Post Office Department, and the War Relocation Authority. Prior to becoming a reference staff member, she specialized in federal records of genealogical interest. She graduated with departmental uh, honors in history from McDaniel College and is pursuing a Master of Archives and Records Administration degree from San Jose State. Uh, today's lecture will provide tips for beginning your genealogical research using federal records. Topics covered include census, immigration, naturalization, and passport application records. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Rose and Rebecca. Good morning, everyone. It's almost the afternoon. It's definitely the afternoon for Rose and myself. We are joining you from Maryland, virtually from our homes. Typically, we both work at the National Archives building in Washington, DC. But because of the pandemic, we're joining you through uh, teleworking. We have been looking forward to this opportunity to discuss the holdings of the National Archives that are relevant to genealogical research with you. While our presentation is geared toward individuals who are beginning their genealogical research, it also serves as a refresher course for experienced researchers. Before I get started, I want to let you know that you are welcome to submit your questions throughout the presentation. We will make sure to address your questions during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation and possibly beforehand. There will be some points during the presentation that we are unable to respond. I want to let you know that you do not need to feverishly take notes since most of the information that we will be covering is also in your handouts. This presentation will be recorded so you can also watch it again. There will be a couple important websites that are not listed in the handouts. Rose will bring them to your attention and recommend that you jot them down in your notes. Since the National Archives has such vast holdings, it's perfectly normal to feel overwhelmed at first. We do not want you to feel like you are lost in a sea of microfilm when you visit us, because there are literally a lot of microfilm cabinets when you get into our microfilm research room, like you're seeing up on the screen there. We have staff stationed throughout the research complex, so do not hesitate to ask them questions. Now, before we get started, let's do just a little bit of housekeeping. It's very important to go over what we have and what we do not have in regard to documentation. The National Archives holds the permanently valuable records of the federal government. That means that only about 3% of the documents that are produced each year are deemed to be permanently valuable. So there is a lot of documentation that never becomes an original archival record. The records are filed by the agency that created them, and the time spans of those various records vary tremendously. Some of the records exist only in original form, while others have been microfilmed and a small percentage of the records include indexes to them. Today we'll be focusing on the civilian records that are frequently used by genealogists, including census, passenger arrival, naturalization, and passport applications. Since the majority of the records that we will be talking about today have been digitized, so just as it's important to talk about what we do have at the National Archives as far as our original records, it's just as important to talk about what we do not have because many researchers think that we are the National Archives so we should have absolutely every kind of documentation and that's certainly not the case. 
To enhance your research, you may also need to examine state and local records. One uh, question that we frequently get from brand new researchers is they're looking for those vital statistics, including birth, death, and marriage, and divorce records. And that's typically something that you will not find at the National Archives, with a few exceptions. Typically, surviving 19th century and early 20th century vital records may be held at the state archives or the court in the county in which the event occurred. Mid to late 20th century vital records are held at the State Bureau of Vital Statistics. The National Archives does not have prepared or published family histories. We have the original records that you can use to write your own family history. The Library of Congress has a collection of published family histories and newspapers, so that is the largest research repository that you would want to go to if you're looking for those published family histories or newspapers. In the genealogy handout that we provided for you, there is also a link to a large-scale project that the Library of Congress has been involved in, and that is Chronicling America. So there are a number of newspapers from around the United States that are now available online that you can view for free. So that's something that you might want to check out when you get a chance. In order to conduct efficient research, you will need to prepare for your research trip in advance. If you have questions, make sure to send a written request to the National Archives at least a month before your research trip. Our staff respond to hundreds of written requests each month, so you want to give us enough time to respond to you. So the type of information that you want to gather is as much as possible, you want to jot down information about the full names of the individuals, if they have a middle initial or their full middle name. If you know that, bring that as well because those names can be documented in various different types of ways. Think about different spellings for surnames that you've seen. Include important dates about your ancestors, such as their birth date, marriage date, death date. Where are they living at a particular period of time? And the most important question that you need to think about and ask yourself when you come to the National Archives is what was my ancestor's relationship to the federal government? So that being said, the National Archives has records and we keep them the way that the agency arranged them. So we do not have specific records that are quote unquote genealogical, but any of those federal records in many cases, anytime they record information about an individual, you could use them for your genealogical research. So if you are specifically coming to visit us to do your own genealogical research, you need to start asking questions like, was my ancestor an immigrant? If that's the case, then you might find a passenger arrival record. Did they travel abroad? If they were a US citizen, then they may have had a passport application. So those are the kind of things that you want to keep in mind. And you'll see a little bit more as we progress through the presentation, some of the records that you can use to get started. First, you want to talk to your elder family members because they know a wealth of information about your family history. And then you want to compile all that information and bring it with you when you come to visit the National Archives. And the more you know, the more you will find. Now, if you're planning on bringing notes with you when you visit the National Archives, I recommend that you bring individual pages. You can bring a notebook into the finding aids room where our staff consult with you, or you can also bring that notebook into the microfilm research room. If you need to bring important information with you and you're going in to look at original records in our textual research room, that's where there's much more in, in the terms of restrictions. That's the case where you want to just have either loose paper that you printed from your computer or some of your handwritten notes. And then make sure it's not something that is your original copy that you don't want something written on because our staff is going to staple those loose pieces of paper together 
and then stamp them on the back with a National Archives approved for the research room stamp. Another thing you can do is just have that important information on your laptop in a digital format because you can definitely bring that laptop as long as it's not in its case throughout the research complex, including up to the textual research room. And the other very important tip that I have for you is to please do not bring your original family papers or photographs when you visit the National Archives. Our security guards check researcher belongings when they are leaving the building. There are security measures in place to ensure that researchers do not steal original records. If there is any question as to whether or not your family papers are part of the National Archives holdings, you may not be able to leave with your family papers. So again, if there's something that you want to show to our staff, scan your original paper and show it to us on your laptop or just bring a paper copy of that original record, not the original record itself. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the records. First in line are the, the census records because they are a good place to start when you're tracing your family over several decades. They offer a, a snapshot of ancestors over every 10 years. The National Archives has census records from 1790 through 1940. Census records are closed for 72 years after they are taken. This is why the 1940 census is the most recent census available. They are arranged by year, state, and thereunder by county. Now, a, a general rule of genealogy is to start with the most recent record that you know and work your way backward. The reason for this general rule to follow is that it ensures that you are not finding an individual just with your ancestor's name, but that you are finding, in fact, your ancestor. And that's especially important if your ancestor has a very common name. Now, as I mentioned, um, census records and any, many of the other federal records that we're going to encounter throughout this, this presentation and ones that you are not going to learn about today but are in our holdings, typically the older a record, the less information that it's going to record. The more recent, there should be more information. And that's certainly the case with census records. Census records vary over time in terms of the information that they record. So from 1790 to 1840, you're just going to have the head of the household and statistical information about the other members of the household. So if you do not know the names of the other members of the household, unfortunately, federal census records are not going to really help you with that information. So let's take an example and look a little closer at the records themselves. So up on the screen here, we have Samuel Yoder. He is the head of the household. And then when you look at all these other columns right up here at the top, they have these age groupings like this that I have on the side where I summarize it because everything's kind of tiny and hard to read up on the screen. So they're, they're grouping the other members of his family into age groups. So for instance, you have two males between the ages of 10 and under 15. You have a, a young little girl that is under the age of five. And you have a female between the age of 20 and under 30. So that's most likely Samuel Yoder's wife. You'd have to do additional research probably with state or local records to confirm that if you do not already know that that is the case. Some of these early census records are actually two pages, so this is the second part of that census record that we were looking at just a moment ago. It notes that the Yoder family has no slaves, and it also tallies up the total number of individuals in the household. This one says that there are seven people in the household, but if you were to count the number of people on the previous page, there are eight. 
So there's a discrepancy. Now, that's something that you encounter doing original research fairly frequently. Um, we will have researchers that either come in on site or write to us off site, and they try to point out that there are mistakes in the records. The National Archives is only interested in preserving that original record. We are not going to go through and make annotations on an original record. It's going to stay the way it is for the rest of the time that it's in the holdings. But that's certainly, if you find a mistake and you're writing your family history, by all means document that mistake and say that you know that there's actually eight members of the household. This census also gives us information about employment. So there are two members of the household that are employed in agriculture and one is employed in manufacturing. So let's move on to the next grouping, which are the 1850 through 1870 census schedules. 1850 is the first year that all members of the household are listed. But these years still do not give you the relationship to the head of the household. And there are separate free and slave schedules for the years 1850 and 1860. So let's take a look at one of the records. Right now we're looking at an 1850 slave schedule from Maryland. Slave schedules usually provide the name of the slave owner and statistical information about the slaves they owned. The information about the slaves is usually statistical in nature, including the slave's age, sex, color, or any disabilities. While in most cases the slaves are not listed by name, on very rare occasions you will find one that has a name listed on the record. Usually this happens if the slave is disabled in some way or has reached the age of 100. Now we're taking a look at the 1870 census. This one's for Arizona. Still, you notice that this record does not give the relationship to everyone in a particular household. Now, the thing that I like to point out about records is if you have an ancestor that walks a straight line, they typically do not, there's not as many records that are generated about them. What you really want when you're doing genealogical research is someone who doesn't play by the rules, whether they commit a crime or have kind of a colorful profession. Um, up on the screen right now, you look a little closer where I drew that red rectangle. If you look at those two women and you look in this column right here, you'll see that they're listed as fancy women. So they're, they're prostitutes. So when you go digging, you don't know what you might find, so be open to family um, skeletons because sometimes families do not talk about those people. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist, and original records might reveal that information. And then we move on to the 1880 to 1940 census. 1880 is the first time that the census records the relationship of the head of the household, what the relationship is with those other members to that head of the household. This is also the first time that enumeration districts are used. For short, an enumeration district is called an ED, and it's the area one census taker could cover during the allotted census time. In urban areas, the ED was usually no longer the no larger than a few city blocks. In rural areas, the ED could be as large as an entire county. This is also when the sound index is used. It's a phonetic indexing system that is based on the sounds that letters make. Sometimes you'll see those on your state driver's license where you have the first letter of your last name followed by three numbers. That's also the use of the sound index. 
And its purpose is to group last names that sound alike together so that accounts for spelling variations because that's definitely something that happens. People's names get misspelled quite frequently. So if your last name was Smith, you might find it under Smythe or vice versa. And that SoundX will help you pick up records that you might accidentally overlook. The 1900, 1910, 1920, and 1930 population census schedules record the year an immigrant arrived in the United States. This is a starting point, but it's not always accurate information. Census records that were taken closer to the year of arrival may be more accurate than later records since an individual's memory fades with time. But they certainly give you a clue and it gives you a snapshot and kind of a time frame to work within. So let's say, for instance, the, let's see, 1930 census says that your ancestor naturalized, and 1920 says that they're an alien. That means that in that 10-year window, somewhere in there, they filed their citizenship papers and naturalized. So then you have a better idea of when to hone your uh, search parameters into to be able to find that naturalization record. And Rose will talk to you about naturalization records a little later during this presentation. Let's take a look at some of these more recent census records. What we have up on the screen is Andrew Davis's family. So he is 70 years old and he's a ship carpenter. And you can see that there's a lot more information that's recorded. So we have his, his state of birth, which is Massachusetts, and his father and mother were also born in Massachusetts. And living with him is his daughter, Mary, who is a teacher and his sister, Lucinda. Now, remember how we had talked about how some documentation is created by an agency and it may never become a federal record? One way that a documentation does not become a federal record is if there is some kind of natural disaster. And in terms of the 1890 federal census, there was a fire when it was being stored long before it became the part of the holdings of the National Archives. So that fire destroyed most of those records. So there's only about 1% fragments of the 1890 census that remain to this day. Now, there's also sometimes some workarounds, and so that's the case with this 1890 census. If you have an ancestor who served on the Union side during the Civil War, the 1890 veteran census is an alternative source for some documentation about your ancestor. Up until this point in the presentation, we have been looking at Census Bureau records. The census that is currently up on the screen is not a Census Bureau record. It is a record that was taken by the Veterans Administration to count the number of union pensioners. Now, this is also a case where mistakes can occur. And mistakes can also be a good thing, because if someone that's taking down information doesn't follow directions to the T, they will record information about someone that shouldn't even be on the record. And then there you have some information about your ancestor that you can glean from the record. So in this case, sometimes this record, people that were taking down the information made a mistake and recorded information about Confederate soldiers, people that served in the War of 1812, and the Mexican War. Now, this is a case where only the schedules from Alabama through the first half of Kentucky, they have not survived either. So there's, there's limited information as far as this veteran serve, um, census as well. Now, in this particular case, if we look up at the top, we have information about William Finn, 
and we learn where he served, that he enlisted in June of 1862, and that he was discharged on October 13th, 1868. Now, if we drop down to the bottom of the page, there's more information about him. His disability was chronic tremble. If we look a little closer, right here we'll see a Moses Codwell. You see, that's a case where there's a mistake. He was discharged for service in the Mexican War. And if you were to look up here, I think his information's up here. There's a line through it, but you can still read everything that was written. So if that was your ancestor, that's some information that's unexpected and certainly worthwhile to add to your family history. Okay, we'll move on to the 1940 census. The purple arrow is actually pointing towards my family. This is my dad's side of the family. Um, Albertus and Agnes are my great grandparents and Lester was my paternal grandfather. This census is interesting because if you look a little closely, you'll see these X's after the names of people. That X indicates that that is the person that answered the question when the census, ta census taker went around recording this information. So it's interesting to find out which one of your ancestors provided that information. As you can see, the 1940 census records a lot of information about individuals, including the highest grade of school completed, where did the person live on April 1st, 1935? And on these pre-printed forms, if your ancestor ends up in one of these that's marked like that or like down here, they end up down below in the supplementary questions. So there's additional questions asked about just those couple of people that are on each page. That includes the place and birth of the person's parents, their mother tongue, language spoken at home. And it also asks if that individual is a veteran or the wife, widow, or child of a veteran, and if the child is the vet veteran father deceased. And then it'll record information about war or military service of the veteran. So the 1940 census was the first to be released digitally. Prior to that, whenever the censuses were released, it was a really big in-person gathering at the various regions of the National Archives, and it would be released on microfilm, and researchers would have to sign up for an allotted time slot to be able to look at the microfilm. 1940 was different on April 2nd, 2012, the records were released online, and then patrons were able to look at the records from the comfort of their own homes. It was released digitally without an index, and there was a bit of a law as some of the online companies started to um, transcribe the records so that you could do a keyword search. So it was very tedious and time consuming prior to the release of those online database indexes to look through and do what we call reading the census, where you just go line by line in the, in the correct area of the census. The nice thing is that since at that point with the release of the 1940, the National Archives had a very strong web presence, we were able to put up on that web page a lot of information to supplement and enhance the research projects, your, your research projects. So, there's finding aids, there's some videos, there's articles, tips for starting your research. That's all there on that website. Now there are a number of records that are related to the census. So those are records like the descriptions of enumeration districts and enumeration district maps. So like I mentioned earlier, each area on these maps have an enumeration district number. 
So if you wanted to go, if you're having trouble looking online and you can't find with a keyword search the ancestor, if you know that they live in a small little town, if you go and look at these maps, it's possible you can find the enumeration district number, figure out the correct role of the population census, put up that page and just start scrolling through that area and do a line by line search until you'll find the person. Uh, my last name's Sharp. I was really having a hard time finding one of my ancestors, and I think they were on there as either Shark or Cher. So I was able to do a wildcard search and do an asterisk after the S-H-A-R asterisk, and eventually I was able to find the person I was looking for. So you kind of have to think outside of the box and think of different ways the name could be spelled, areas where like uh, a cursive A could look like a cursive O, and just kind of think about that, and that sometimes will help you find a record that's hard to come by. We also have the 1885 territorial censuses and the 1935 Puerto Rico census. Now in terms of availability, the census is widely available. You have several research options available to you. You can look at microfilm at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., where Rose and I work. You can also check with your closest region and see if they have the microfilm. Family search centers are located throughout the United States, so if you visit their website, you can find your closest family search center. And there are a number of online options too. So Ancestry and Fold3 are both subscription-based services. You can access these websites for free whenever you visit a National Archives research facility. Several of the handouts that we gave you include a web link that you can visit to find your nearest National Archives location. During the pandemic, Ancestry has made many of the digitized records from the National Archives holdings free. Ancestry has not given a timeline for when this free offer will expire, but that's certainly something that you can take advantage of right now and see if you can do some federal census research. You can usually access digitized records for free from the Family Search website. If you're viewing this website from school or home, you need to sign up for a free user account. When you visit the National Archives, you do not need to sign into an account. And then your last option is to do a mail order request for a census record. Now, since there are so many census records and not all of them are indexed, our staff is limited in what they can offer you for copying. We do not do index searches of the records, so you would have to give us very specific information, and that information that we need you will find on the census handout. And then, of course, there's a fee for a copy of the record. Essentially what you're doing is giving us a full citation for the census page. So you will have already had to do your census research prior to contacting the National Archives and requesting a, a record. Now we'll move on to immigration records. Immigration records were created by two different federal agencies according to the time frame. So between 1820 and 1890, those records are US Customs Service records, the earliest port that the National Archives has is 1800, most typically. There's a few exceptions and they're on your immigration handout. Immigration and Naturalization Service is another agency that started keeping records beginning in 1891, and that published passenger arrival microfilm goes up to 1957. The National Archives has passenger arrival records for all the major ports, including Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Boston, New Orleans, and San Francisco. If you look at your passenger arrival research um, handout, you will see a link to the immigration page that we have on our website, and that will give a much more complete listing of the various ports that we have records for. We also have border crossing records. 
St. Albans is for the Canadian border crossings. And we have Mexican border crossings covering several port cities. So what can you find in an immigration record? Like I was mentioning earlier, records vary over time. Now with passenger arrival records, the early ones start off not providing very much information. Then you get into the 1920s and there's a lot of information about each passenger. And then it becomes sparse again in the 1940s and in the 1950s. And I'll show you some examples of the records as we go a little further into the pre presentation. But in general, all of the passenger arrival records provide you with the name of the vessel, the name of the ship's master, port of arrival and embarkation, date of departure, and date of arrival. Early to mid 19th century passenger arrivals will give you information including the name of the individual, their age, occupation, country of origin, and their destination. Let's take a look at some of these records. Up on the screen, we have the Brig Experiment, which arrived at the Port of Philadelphia on June 27, 1809. Unfortunately, records are not always in pristine condition. There are a number of ways that records can become damaged or destroyed. And this is particularly challenging with the passenger arrival records because remember, they are literally out there being kept around water and watering is not a friend of a record. It can smear ink and it can damage the records in other ways. And including if a ship sank, the records were lost with the ship. Water damage can damage that ink and cause bleeding resulting in illegible text. Insects and vermin may also cause damage to records. And like we mentioned earlier, records could be damaged or totally destroyed by fire. If a record is made of poor quality paper or if it is used frequently, it can tear. And when an re original record tears, information may be permanently lost. So if you look at this record, I mean, there's a lot of pieces of that paper that are no longer there. Then we see possibly a little bit of the water damage here. Some of that there as well. If the damage, like this one right here, if this was down a little further, you might end up losing some of the names of the people that are on the ship. And that could be an explanation as to if you do a lot of passenger arrival research and you're just not finding your ancestor, maybe their name is spelled with poor handwriting and it's illegible, or maybe part of the record is missing and that piece of paper that chunked out is where the name was. Now, this is mainly a cargo list, so all this information up here is cargo on the ship, and it includes things like boxes of linen, a chest of glass, and some sealing wax. If you drop down to this portion of the record, you have minimal information about the passengers. So we have a Henry Voigt, his wife and three children. We don't know their names. And they're traveling with one trunk and bags of bedding and that's all we know about them. So we'll move on and take a look at something that's a little bit more recent. As you see, as time goes on, since there's so many more passengers on these ships, they start having pre-printed forms that they fill out the various columns like name, occupation, what country are you from. You can even see here there's a died on voyage part of that. So unfortunately, that being on a pre-printed form means that there were quite a few deaths on ships to have that as something that they're recording regularly. Now, let's see here. We've got a Mary Callahan who's 17 years old and she's Irish. 
a domestic servant who's going to Chicago. And then when we look down here, we have two babies that were born at sea on August 10th, 1886. The record itself notes that there's an uncertainty about how to spell their last name. It's either Housen or Polson. And unfortunately, these two babies passed away during this, this trip. And it lists the, the death cause, which is most likely a partial or a complete loss of consciousness, probably due to heart problems. So as we move along and the records become a little bit newer, uh, 19th century and 20th century passenger arrival records give you a lot of information, including who is traveling with the individual, occupation, where did they last reside, the names and addresses of the relatives that they're going to join in the United States. It'll ask if they're a polygonist or an anarchist. So if you answered yes to either one of those questions, that earned you a trip right back to your country of origin. And then it will also give you the amount of money that the person is carrying on their person. Let's take a look at some of these more recent records. So up on the screen, we have a 1923 passenger arrival at the Port of New York. And when you get into these more recent records, they will have passenger lists like this one up on the screen that says it's a list of the United States citizens. There will be separate lists for the aliens that are coming in. It has columns for the birthplace. And then there's a column here about um, naturalization. Now, what we've found over the course of working with various records is sometimes people that are filling in these records put information down in a spot that really isn't predetermined for that information. So in this case, we have all these numbers. And my colleague and I figured out over time that a lot of times people that are recording this information, the passenger manifest recorded the person's passport application number. So again, this is a case where the passenger arrival record is giving you a clue to be able to find another record. Now, sometimes like the manifest that you see up here, it's not real clear what these numbers are. Through some research, my colleague and I figured out that this is the application number, and then it's followed by a capital letter. That capital letter is the first letter of the surname of the Secretary of State, who was in office at the time that the passport was issued. So if you were to look up the secretaries of states, that'll give you a general idea. If you figure out when they were serving in office, you'll get a general idea of when those passports were issued. And that'll help you kind of hone in your research. Rose will show you another example a little bit later that's a little bit more obvious that it is a passport. So we've got an individual by the name of Seth Van Slars, and he is traveling. He's got a passport number. His destination in the U.S. is care of T.C. and Son, New York. There are several other people on that manifest, so it's possible they're going to work somewhere. You'd have to do some additional research to try to verify what that company is. And then you can see also that there's some crossed out names. So whenever you see that on a passenger arrival record, that means that the individual didn't travel on the ship. But since they didn't cross it out entirely, you can still read the information. So that's, that's a gem if that's your ancestor. And then like I mentioned earlier, when we get into the 1950s and 1940s, the records have much less information than they did in the 20s. So that's certainly the case with this 1953 example that's up on the screen right now. You have these two individuals here with the last name Alexander. There's really no way just by looking at this record to determine whether they're related to each other. Although since I've worked a lot with passport applications, 
I see that they have the same passport number. So that to me tells me that they are a member of the same family. Most likely they're probably husband and wife, or maybe it could be a father and daughter, because at this time, passports were not always issued to each person. They could be issued to a family altogether as one. And Rose will give you some examples as we get into the presentation a little bit later. The other thing that we learn about them is their place of birth and then what kind of luggage they're carrying. And then there's really nothing else to have other than their official arrival into the United States and the name of the ship that they came on. We'll move on. Here we have a border crossing record. It is uh, 1909. You can see it's very similar to those ship manifests. We've got a Percival Burgess, and he's traveling with his wife Emily and son William. He's originally from England, and he's going to Detroit, Michigan. This record notes that he never traveled to the United States prior to this date, and he answered that he's not a polygamist or an anarchist. We move on here to a border crossing record, and it's also recording the similar information that we saw on the prior records. The difference is instead of a manifest listing multiple individuals, each one of these border crossing cards relates to a specific individual. So in this case, we have a Daniel Bratton, who is an electrician. Now see, it gives you a clue about where you might find additional documentation. Unfortunately, he's not here during a census year, so you wouldn't pick up him in an earlier census. But if, if he was, that would be a clue to go look back at the census and see if he's enumerated there. See. So the other interesting thing about this record is if you look here with this stamp, he's crossing at a toll bridge. We'll move on to the most important question is how do you access these records? So passenger arrival records are widely available just like the census records. They've been microfilmed, so you can come to the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., and we have all the microfilm for the various ports. And then the regions also have select microfilm for passenger arrivals. We recommend that you call them before you visit them just to make sure that they have records for the port that you're interested in. So let's say you're doing an arrival at Philadelphia, you would most likely call the National Archives at Philadelphia, and they more than likely have that relevant microfilm publication. Family search centers are another place that you could visit. And as far as online access, Ancestry has digitized most of the microfilmed records, and they've made it possible to do keyword searches by name. Ellis Island has digitized the New York arrivals for 1892 to 1924. And with passenger arrival records, if you can give the name of the individual, the port, on, port of arrival, and the approximate date of arrival, as long as the National Archives has an index to that port, you can fill out a form online or mail that form in. And for a fee, we will provide you with a copy of the record. Your passenger arrival research handout gives you more information about how to find that form to submit to order a copy. Now, as I've been mentioning throughout the presentation, there are related re records to immigration records, and those include naturalization, passport applications, Siemens protection certificates, which are 
very similar to passport applications, but for those that are at sea. We also have visa app applications for a small window of time between 1914 and 1940. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to Rose Buchanan. All Rose? All right, well, thank you. Oh, you are there. Yes, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, everyone. I know I was finishing up a, a chat message. We've been having um, a lively chat um, so far, so thank you, everybody, for sending in your questions and comments. Um, oh, we nice. We'll circle back around. Nice. Yeah, yeah, we will circle back around to some of those once we, um, once we wind up finishing the presentation. I look forward to right. being able to get into the chat room. I, I cannot see it right now because I'm in the slideshow mode, but at the end, I'll be able to get in there and join in. Yes, and so since Rebecca is controlling the PowerPoint, um, I we are working in tandem now, so, but we will definitely get back to your questions, so, so keep them coming. So in terms of naturalization records, um, the first Naturalization Act was passed in 1790. And so that act provided that an alien who desired to become a citizen of the United States should apply to any common law court of record in any one of the states wherein he shall have resided for the term of one year at least. That was the language in the act. And what that meant was that if, if an alien came, came over and, and um, resided in the United States for a period of time, typically at least two years, um, it changed as, as various as uh, various laws were passed, but typically two years, um, and then decided that they wanted to become a naturalized um, U.S. citizen. They could go to a municipal court, a county court, state court, or a federal court before 1906 and declare that they wanted to naturalize. So for most of the 19th century, Folks just went to the county that was closest, or the, rather the court that was closest to them. That was um, often the county court to file their naturalization paperwork. Um, so in that case, as, as we'll see, um, the National Archives won't have those records. As Rebecca was talking earlier, um, the National Archives only has federal records. So we will only have records of naturalizations that took place in federal court. Um, after 1906, theoretically, um, individuals were supposed to naturalize in federal courts, but it took some time for that practice to, to really take hold. So if you have an ancestor who naturalized in the 20th century, it, it might still be possible that they naturalized in a, a state or local court. But also after 1906, courts were required to report naturalizations to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS. So the the successor agency to the INS, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, actually has a copy of naturalization paperwork, and they have an index to the records that they have. So you can contact the USCIS if you're just striking out in all other sources um, and, and request that they do an index search for you. Um, the URL is on the screen there. I will say, though, that the um, index and the services the USCIS provides, there is a fee for that. So next slide, please. So nationalization was a two-step process. As, as we've been uh, discussing in the chat so far, um, there are two sets, generally, two sets of paperwork that um, you might be able to find on an ancestor who naturalized. So the process began when an alien filed a, a declaration of intention, um, so otherwise known as first papers. So in that documentation, they went to a court and um, federal court, theoretically after 1906, and they renounced their allegiance to their former country. Um, they also had to provide proof of residence for usually about two years. Um, and then after another three years, they could file their petition for naturalization. So this is a formal application for U.S. citizenship. If everything was was fine, the court would grant would. Um, give them a certificate of citizenship, would issue them that certificate, and the, the alien would have that copy with, um, and keep that documentation with them um, if they needed to prove that they were a citizen. Um, after 1906 as well, the um, copies of the certificate were also submitted to the INS, so the USCIS now has copies of certificates as well. In general, the National Archives will have declarations of intention and naturalization petitions from federal courts 
we do not have typically the certificates of citizenship, again, because those were given to the aliens or rather the naturalized citizens um, after, they were na after they naturalized. So a key point in doing this naturalization research is when, is knowing that an alien did not have to file sets of paperwork in the same court. So they might have filed, let's say they came over and they settled in New York for a little while. Maybe they filed their declaration of intention in a court in New York, but then after a couple of years, they moved west. Maybe they moved to Michigan and they filed their naturalization petition in Michigan. That was fine, um, but that just makes it a lot harder to do research when when you are um, trying to find both sets of paperwork. You've got to check uh, potentially different different levels, different of of archives, and maybe a, a state court in the first in, in, instance and a federal court in the second. Um, so you may be having to check multiple repositories. Um, now it's also um, important to keep in mind that, as Rebecca was saying. Clues to when an individual naturalized can be found in census records. Um, that can kind of give you a time frame by which to start your research and pinpoint where people were residing at different points in time. So these records, as, as we'll continually say, continually mention, these records definitely work in concert with each other. The so next slide, please. So on this slide, you can see an overview of the types of information that you can find in a, in a declaration of intent, typically, not always. Um, most of the time before 1906, the information you'll find in a declaration is rather sparse. Um, you'll just have a, a name, the country that the individual was renouncing their allegiance to, um, date of application and the signature. Um, after 1906, you can get a lot more information, often because the forms that individuals were submitting their information on became more standardized. So you can even, you can get the port and date of arrival, their last address abroad, their present address. Um, after 1930, you might even be able to find a photograph. Next slide, please. So the same is, is typically true for naturalization petitions as the second papers um, that individuals filed. The before 1906, you get sort of mostly the same information um, in terms of where the individual was from, um, the date and country of birth. Um, you might be able to find an occupation. Sometimes those, again, we were discussing in the chat earlier, you can find um, their port and date of arrival, but not always. Um, it depends, again, on the particular court they may have naturalized in, the types of forms that they used. Um, after 1906, um, you get a little more detailed information, even in including information about the alien or um, soon to be naturalized citizen's family in some cases, which can be great for genealogical research. Next slide, please. So as with everything you'll find in doing research, there are exceptions to the two-step process rule. So derivative citizenship is probably one of the biggest ones. So before 1922, wives, and, wives of naturalized citizens did not have their own naturalization paperwork. So citizenship of married women followed the citizenship of their husbands. So that, and that worked both ways. That worked if a immigrant came over and their alien husband naturalized, then she became a naturalized citizen as well. And if an American-born woman married an alien, she could lose her U.S. citizenship. So, in, but then in, in September 22nd, 1922, um, Congress passed the Cable Act. And so that law allowed um, married women to have their own naturalization um, independently of their husbands. So after that, you can, you can start to see separate naturalization paperwork for immigrant wives. Um, children under the age of 21 um, up until 1940 can also be subsumed underneath the naturalization of their fathers. Um, minor aliens, too, can be an exception. Um, if they were living in the U.S. for five years prior to the 23rd birthday, um, they might have been able to file declarations and petitions together uh, between the years of 1824 and 1906. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're looking for either, either um, female ancestors, women, um, and or children. 
The next slide, please. Uh, soldiers and veterans um, are another big exception to the rule, the two-step, two-process um, rule. So an 1862 law um, allowed honorably discharged Army veterans to petition for naturalization uh, without filing a declaration of intent if they could prove that they had been, uh, they had a year of residence in the country. Um, an 1894 law extended this um, this exception to honorably discharged Navy or Marine Corps veterans um, did not have to file the declaration of intent, um, but it did require that the individuals had five years of military service. The next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there can be, it can be challenging to find nationalization records, um, given that they're, they can be spread out through multiple archival repositories. So you may have to check a county court or a county or state archives, uh, particularly before 1906. Um, you might be able to find county court records at National Archives regional facilities if microfilm versions were donated to the regional facility. That's generally an exception rather than a rule, but it is possible um, in some cases. Um, but near us, uh, our bread and butter, of course, is, is, the, is the federal court records. And so court records at the National Archives are housed at our regional facilities based on the state in which that court was located. So at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., where Rebecca and I work, we house records of federal courts in the District of Columbia. So if you had an ancestor who naturalized in the district, we would probably have um, those records if they naturalized before 1926. Um, 1926 and after, Still remain records still remain with the court. Um, if you had an ancestor who naturalized in North Carolina, where I'm from, then the National Archives of Atlanta has records of federal courts in North Carolina. So it's um, the website that's listed on the slide that gives you a breakdown of, of which National Archives regional facility houses court records from which states. So that's definitely a, a website you want to take a look at. Um, again, post-1906, um, select records are at National Archives regional facilities, um, but again, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, they should have a copy of naturalization paperwork after 1906. So if you strike out at near facilities, you, you can double check with the CIS. Next slide. So there are indexes to some naturalization records in our custody. So here is an example um, of one index card from the U.S. District Court in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and in this case, the individual naturalized in 1882. Um, he was originally from England. Um, it provides an individual um, who can attest to um, this, this person's naturalization and, and residency. And it indicates that the, the individual was honorably discharged um, from the Navy. Um, so the, most of our indexes to naturalization records are microfilmed. Um, increasingly, they're getting online um, in, in places like Ancestry or, or Family Search. Um, but you can, we have um, copies of the microfilm in DC. Um, some of our regions may have copies of indexes for the courts um, records that they house at those facilities. Um, always before you want to make a visit to a facility, whether it's our DC one or another. Um, of our region, always reach out to us first to double check, um, just to make sure that we, we do have the microphone or the records that you're looking for. Next slide, please. So here is an example of a declaration of intention filed by Ellen Brosnan on June 27, 1927. So as you can see, in this case, we're, we're lucky. Um, this, this record provides or passenger arrival information. Um, in this case, Ellen arrived to the United States in Baltimore, Maryland on October 1879 on the ship SS Nova Scotia. And so you'll note that that's a pretty big difference, right? She got here in 1879 and then she didn't file her declaration of intention until 1927. Part of that might be because she was married and so she couldn't provide, she couldn't file the naturalization paperwork on her own. Um, previously, she was um, her naturalization was assumed under her husband, or it could have been that 
she just didn't feel a need to naturalize until 1927. There was no requirement that people come over and they and they had to naturalize. So so sometimes people didn't if, if they didn't feel a personal need. Rebecca, if you'll click. So if an immigrant arrived in the U.S. after June 29, 1906, the Immigration and Naturalization Service had to verify their lawful entry into the U.S. by locating the arrival record. So in this case, if the, um, if the INS verified that, that a person came in when they said they came in, then they completed a certificate known as, or certification known as the Certificate of Arrival. And, but before 1906, this, this certificate wasn't required. So in this case, um, the INS took a look at their passenger arrival records. Um, they noted that yes, Ellen, Ellen came over and, um, and arrived on the Nova Scotia on the date she said she came. Um, and they, they submitted this certificate um, for inclusion with her naturalization paperwork. The next slide, please. And here we see Ellen's petition. Um, it's on October 15th, 1929. And it's quite a bit of, of information up to and including affidavits of witnesses. So people on that right hand page, you can see that said, you know, yes, we know Ellen, we are her neighbors, we are her friends, we are her relatives. We can say that, you know, she has been here the time that she says she's been here. Um, and um, you can see various signatures. So uh, this can be, again, really helpful information for verifying not just a person's citizenship, but a per where they lived at particular times. I mean, again, using in, in concert with these other records that we're discussing. The so next slide, please. And this is not Ellen Brosnan, as you can see, um, but this is a certificate of naturalization, um, an example. So again, again, the National Archive generally doesn't have um, certificates. So this is actually from, I believe Rebecca found um, this copy at the um, USCIS. But it, 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 this one is, yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, it can be very, very nice. And we're lucky in this case that um, this one has a photograph. So this is for Robert Crawford. Um, and again, the, these certificates were given to the individual um, after they naturalized to, to take with them and they could um, show it for documentation of their citizenship. So if you're interested in certificates, um, you can contact the USCIS. If you have one from just your family's paper or papers, it can start, it can help you begin to work backwards from the certificate to begin finding the naturalization position and potentially the declaration of intention as well. Because as you'll see in this case, Robert Crawford, he naturalized in the District of Columbia. So you would know that he naturalized in a DC court. Well, the National Archives building in DC houses historical records of a DC court. In this case, unfortunately, we wouldn't have this one because he naturalized in October 1st, 1940. Um, that's too late for our holding. But you could go to that court, um, which would house more recent records and see if they have the actual position. So clues can be found in these records as well. The next slide, please. Okay, so passport records, or we should definitely make sure to note from the top, passport application records. Um, so the National Archives has passport applications from 1795 to March 31st, 1925. So these are um, the documentation that individuals filed with the Department of State um, in order to get a passport. Um, it's important to, to note that an individual, until 1941, um, people, US citizens weren't required to have passports to travel abroad. So often people applied for a passport anyway, um, because it was useful to have that official documentation if they were abroad. But it wasn't required. Um, there are two brief exceptions um, to that rule. Once during the Civil War and once during World War I, um, before 1941, were individuals required to have passports. But other than that, it was a voluntary process for the most part. And of course, passports are only issued to US citizens. So if someone had not naturalized, then they wouldn't be able to get a US passport. They would travel on a passport from their um, country of origin if they travel on a passport at all. But in terms of the passport applications that we have, 
Um, you can see on the screen that some of the different types of information you can find in the application depending on the year. Um, so some early passport applications that we have are pretty sparse as we'll, as we'll go as we'll see. We'll take a look at a number of examples. But some of those early applications were just letters. They were handwritten letters um, submitted submitted to the Department of State that explained that the individual was a citizen, explained where they wanted to travel abroad, um, and asked for a um, asked for a passport. Um, between 1906 and 1925, um, the Department of State used preprinted forms. So you begin to see a lot more standardized information, um, typically a, a two-page form. Um, that information can get pretty detailed, um, and it can also be accompanied by affidavits from family members, um, letters submitted by employers, notations of military service, copies of birth records, um, any of these other information that, that would help establish that the individual was a, a U.S. citizen, um, they were traveling a legitimate business. I mean, it was all of these this extra documentation that can be um, would have been helpful for officials to know when um, issuing that passport. So beginning on December 21st, 1914, there are also photographs attached to each application. Um, so we will we'll take a look at some of those examples further on. But the original passport applications are housed at the National Archives at College Park, Maryland, with other Department of State records. So you can you can request copies of photographs from them. Um, I should note that all of our passport applications are on microfilm. That microfilm has been digitized and made available online um, through Ancestry.com, Old3.com, and Family Search. Um, so you can search these as online as we'll see. So next slide, please. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So in this case, this is one of the early passport applications that I was mentioning that's just a letter. So Jonathan Ogden wrote in to the Department of State on September 16, 1830. Um, he was requesting a passport for himself and his family. Um, he included the information about his citizenship, his residency, um, his age, and his daughter's ages. Uh, but what we like about this example is just his colorful description of his daughters. So it's a little hard to read on the screen, but um, Jonathan Ogden wrote, he said, I have resided in New York about 39 years and have been a citizen 30 or 35 years. I'm 62 years old. I take with me my three daughters, the eldest Sarah, age 21, Grace W, age 16, and Charlotte E, age 12, all short of our age, save the youngest who is thin and rather tall for 12 and is still growing. So that just, you know, you can find the fun little details like that in some of these records. So it can be sort of sort of flesh out you know, the information that you can find about ancestors. So in this case, um, the notation you see down at the bottom, the M1372, that's a um, National Archives publica microphone publication number. Um, so that just provides um, you with the, the microphone where you'll find uh, this documentation, specifically on roll one. The next slide, please. So here we have another example of one of those handwritten letters. In this case, it's Robert Morris's passport application issued on June 28, 1861. So this is a sort of special case. So um, actually, Robert Morris was, was African American. So prior to the end of the Civil War, um, the Department of State's policy toward African Americans who applied for US passports was very inconsistent. Um, the issue was whether or not African Americans were considered U.S. citizens. I mean, that wasn't settled until um, after the Civil War and with um, passages of um, various um, amendments to the Constitution. Uh, but the Department of State usually granted uh, special forms noting that African Americans who applied for passports before the Civil War um, were free um, and were born in the U.S. Um, on rare occasions, um, standard passports were issued. But in uh, Robert Morrison's case, um, in 1861, he applied for a passport, and he included a physical description that said his complexion was colored and his, short wa and his hair was short and curly. Um, he did not receive a response from the Department of State, however, in a reasonable amount of time, so he got help from Charles Sumner, a senator from Massachusetts. 
Uh, Sumner contacted the Secretary of State, William Seward, who said that while he was hesitant to issue a passport to Mr. Morris based on the physical description provided, he would issue one if Sumner identified Morris only as a citizen of the U.S. So that's why we have such a sparse application here. It just says, please send me a passport for Robert Morris Jr. of Boston, a citizen of the U.S. So if you come across something like this in the records, I mean, it could be a clue to other information, um, in this case, that Robert Morris was African-American and that there was this whole story behind this, this one sentence letter. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And if you come across that, you can always um, contact us and maybe we can, we can look further. Hey, Rose, I'm going to jump in a little bit too. Yeah, please do. So this one is actually a real life research scenario. I received a phone call from a researcher many years ago, and he said that he was looking on these at the passport application. He found this single piece of paper online, and he said, isn't there anything else? So he shared the copy that you see with me there. I looked at it and said, you know, this is very unusual. You should usually have a physical description of the individual date of birth, all that kind of vital information. So I said, let me do some checking into it and I'll get back to you. So the first thing that I did was pull up the relevant role of microfilm. It only had one page. I think I called out to one of my colleagues at our College Park facility where they have the originals. The original was only one page. And so when you stump an archival staff member, it's probably a good thing because it makes us uh, start to kind of spin <laughs> our wheels. And I, I like the detective aspect of our job, solving puzzles. So I started looking at it and I think at this point I was able to do some keyword searching online and I found something associated with Robert Morris's name and it was coming up about Charles Sumner. And then when I was looking at the sloppy signature, I said, yeah, maybe that is Charles Sumner's name. And I went over and visited one of the National Archives librarians. And I said, you know, what do you think about this? I think Charles Sumner was involved. And he said to me, well, you know, Rebecca, I have his complete published works. Well, then lo and behold, there's the story that Rose just told you as to how all this happened and why there's only one sheet of paper. So we were able to confirm that there is not an heir, this is the original record, and that's all there is. So you just never know. Sometimes there's a reason why you don't find very much. And sometimes you have to, to look in unexpected places. I mean, Charles Sumner's papers would probably not be the first place you'd think to look necessarily um, if you're if you're we're researching Robert Morris's um, history and the history of his family, but I mean, this turned out to be really important information um, to understand his passport application. So good sleuthing, Rebecca. That was a fun one. I'll always remember <laughs> that one. I, that's the other thing too. If you stump an archive staff member, usually we'll always remember how to find something like that again. Oh, very true. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go to the next slide. The next slide. There we go. It takes a little bit. Um, so in this case, we have Elizabeth Ware's um, passport application. So if we click back, Rebecca, maybe I think the um the animation a little bit. Yeah, I had a little glitch. Um, but what's a webinar without a technology glitch, right? So right. Elizabeth's um application and that of her husband um store were um some of those those pre printed forms I was mentioning. So they filed um much later, nineteen twenty three for passport. Um so the information you can find on those applications is much more detailed. It provides, for example, their marriage date. Um, they happen to get married um, October 19th, 1907. Um, you'll also see the names and ages of their six children. So on the left, um, it wasn't uncommon for children to travel on the passports um, of their mothers. So 
you can see, and, and the reason it looks so strange, Rebecca and I were talking about it yesterday, um, on, the, on Elizabeth's uh, application, that white block um, in which oh, you yeah, see her children's names. Yeah, it's actually a, um, a piece of paper um, they had so many children they didn't fit in the in the the blanks um, provided on the on the um, form so they had to officials had to attach this extra extra piece of paper um, so it doesn't show up as well on the microfilm but the originals originals would show you that this is, is a flap um, a, a um, attached piece of paper um, so in this case again you can you can see um, a little more details um, about the entire family and then Rebecca if you'll click um, you'll see, we, we got a glimpse already, but you will see um, photographs of the family as well. These are again from um, in color and from the, from the originals. Um, so the entire family, all six children on the left and, the, and their mother and then the father on the right. The next slide, please. So here we have, um, some documentation passport application for Moses Kordinsky. He his passport was issued on July 13th, uh, 1921, and so he was born in Kiev, uh, Russia, at the time, and became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1903. Uh, so he moved to Jerusalem um, in 1914 for religious observance, as he explains. Um, but the events of World War One actually prevented him from returning to the U.S. Um, his return was delayed further by severe illness. Um, so this certificate is actually from his doctor in Jerusalem. It was written in 1921 and shows that he had suffered, Mr. Kredinsky had suffered from chronic gastroenteritis since 1918. Uh, um, so you can find out all kinds of information about um, your ancestors in some cases. And in this case, it explains why uh, he might not have been in the U.S. Um, for the time where you might have expected him. So he planned to return to the U.S. though and settle there permanently, as he explained. Um, he had two sons and seven daughters, um, all of whom lived in the U.S. and were U.S. citizens. So next slide. Oh yes, and it's a, another doc, another piece of documentation from this application. Um, do you so want to see it or here, do you want to go back? Um, we can we we can um, keep going. Um, but okay. if anybody wants to see it at the end, we can we can pop back. Um, so here, as Rebecca mentioned, you can find um, pass, uh, passport implica uh, information on passenger manifests. So in this case, this is a manifest from um, 1922. And in the column for naturalization, um, there is the passport number. So we're fortunate in this case that it's, it's very clear what the passport number is. It, the documentation says U.S. passport and then gives the number. But that's not always the case. Um, sometimes the other notations that you'll find on manifest, um, they might just say US pass, they might say US PP, um, they might say PP, or they might just have a number. Um, if you can see in the middle column on your screen, um, there's a handwritten number, just 177551, I believe it is, um, and maybe 541, and that, appears in this in this case we do have a typewritten version of it in the in the next column over that confirms that it's the passport number but for some reason um there was a handwritten documentation as well so you can find pay attention to these numbers you see noted on passenger manifest they might lead you to additional documentation the next slide please So here is Margaret Hallberg's uh, passport application. So that was actually her manifest we were looking at um, before in which, it, in which it said that her passport number was 125002, issued on March 9th, 1922. So we could take that information and then go track down this passport application. Um, and actually working with these passport applications and, and then in concert with all these other records that we've been talking about today, um, you can reconstruct a fair amount of biographical information about individuals, um, particularly for these um, early 20th century records that have more information included on them. So in Margaret's case, she was born in Norway on April 4th, 1869. Her father was Johannes Andersen Halberg. She immigrated to the U.S. in March of 1894 and became a naturalized U.S. citizen on 
June 1st, 1914. Um, she was a teacher, and in 1919, her permanent residence was Baton Rouge, Louisiana. By 1922, she had moved to Little Rock, Arkansas, where she resided for resided at the School for the Deaf. Further research might have been able to confirm if she was actually employed by that school. So she, in these applications, um, you can actually see she filed two, one in 1919 and one in 1922. Um, she, Margaret was traveling back to Norway to visit family. Um, the 19, 1922 application reveals that she resided outside the U.S. twice, between 1910 and 1911, and again between October 1919 and March 1920. The application also notes that she lived in four different locations during her 27 years in the U.S. So in addition to Arkansas, Louisiana, she also lived in Washington, D.C. and Minnesota. So we have a wealth of information here, um, particularly the information about where Margaret lived at various points in time could help you pinpoint where else you might need to look for records, um, where you might need to look specifically in census records or um, state or local records. And you can also see, we like these, these pictures here, um, just I mean, literal snapshots of, of people at different points in their life. You get a, you get a really good sense of, of uh, Margaret's life and, and who she was and what she did. The next slide, please. Okay, so th in this case, um, we had an instance in which we were looking. We did an um, index search for Grace Bulmer and found that she had a passport issued on December 24th, 1923. Um, but when we went to look for the actual passport application, this sheet is all we got. So what this is, is a document transfer sheet. Um, as you can see, it, it provides um, Grace's passport number, um, the passport application number, um, the date, and then it says date of transfer, May 17th, 1926. So what this means is that it, um, on May 17th, 1926, Department of State recalled her passport application. It, it, they um, took it out and, and needed it for um, some other reason. Typically, verification purposes, it suggests that Grace uh, filed for another passport um, in, in 1926. And so they wanted to, the Department of State wanted to pull out her first one to, to verify information. Um, so when you find these document transfer sheets, you'll, you'll start to see more and more of them pop up in the um, 1920s. Um, in the 19, records that we have for the 1920s, um, you'll want to contact the Department of State. They house um, records, passport applications after um, March 31st, um, 1925, so April 1st, 1925 and onward. Um, you'd want to contact them for the actual application. Um, I should note here, and the reason why this is this is so close together, now, nowadays we have passports. I think the last time I got it, my passport renewed, it, it was eight years ago or so our passports last a lot longer um, now and in these um, early years a passport generally was valid for two years or so so this is why you see grace applying for a passport in 1923 and then possibly applying for another one in march 1926. so an important thing to note also with these document transfer sheets um, you these the passport applications for this time period are on ancestry.com but Ancestry did not index the document transfer sheets. So when you do a name search, the Ancestry won't necessarily find them. So that's why it's important to check um, the indexes that we have for passport applications. Um, our passport um, indexes, application indexes um, run out, I believe, in 1923. So you might have to just browse, um, browse the records, looking for um, records related to a, your particular ancestor. Next slide, please. So here's an example again of what we were mentioning, what I was mentioning before about photographs. So um, starting in 1914, you can see photographs of individuals attached to the passport applications. Because the records are, are microfilms, uh, the microfilm version isn't always that clear of, of the photograph. So this is Tansy Freeze um, on the left. You can see about half of his face, and that's about it. But if you were to look at the original, um, Rebecca, if you want to click, you would see a whole different story. Um, in this case, the original, the actual photograph is, is very clear, and so you get a good look at him. Um, as I mentioned before, the original passport applications are housed at the National Archives at College Park. 
So one of our handouts talks about how you can contact them if you want a higher resolution copy of a photograph um, and, and they can take a look for you. The next slide, please. In terms of availability of passport applications, we have um, copies of the microfilm in our facility in DC. Um, select regions will also have copies as well, but again, you always wanna reach out to them first to confirm. Um, family search centers can have copies of the microfilm, but the records are also digitized on Ancestry and Fold3. So Ancestry has the full range of records that we have. Um, so from 1795 up to 1925, I believe Fold3 has records from 1790 to 1906, so they don't have those, those later two decades. Um, if you're interested in a copy, again, you can um, consult our, our handout that we sent around about how to order copies. Um, you can also um, send us an email with the specific information about your, um, your ancestor, their, their name, their, their travel dates, birth dates, uh, places of residence, and, and so on. The next slide. And that is all I have. Um, we are certainly very glad that you all you all came today and, and spent the time to uh, learn more about records that we have in our holdings. Um, if you have any questions, which I see there are quite a few in the chat, uh, we will begin to answer them. So how, the way to work, how about I will read out um, a question from the chat, Rebecca, and then we can um, tackle, them, tackle them together. How's that sound? Good. And I'll... I'll exit out of this PowerPoint so that I can see the chats too, because right now all I can see are the slides. Okay. I'll come join you. Yeah. All right, well then I will take a look. So it looks like the first question we had here, so we've been, um, previously during the, the discussion, we were taking a look, I'll just um, head back a little bit. We did have a question about when the National Archives will be um, open again in terms of pulling in this case, specifically on um, Civil War pension files and compiled military service records. Um, we don't have a date yet, unfortunately, for when our facility is going to be back open. It's just going to depend on, on how the pandemic works um, works out, unfortunately. But you can check our website. Um, this constantly being updated. Um, definitely will have whichever date um, is, is determined for when we reopen. So that website, I, I put it in the chat, but it's also um, archives.gov slash coronavirus, um, so you can, you can check that out. And then we had a, had a question about how you can confirm um, your ancestor on immigration arrivals, um, passenger manifest, particularly when they have, there's a, a lot of the same names. Um, so Rebecca, do you wanna, you wanna give that one a shot? So if you have people that have the same kind of names, um, mm -hmm. hopefully How do you know which one it could be your ancestor? It seems like, now this isn't always the case either, but researchers sometimes tend to have an idea of when people arrived or or even if you don't know the date exactly, um, if you have an idea of where they settled in the United States. So let's say that they settled in New York City, you might want to look at the New York ports because it's really driven by, to find a record you need to know the port and approximate year of arrival. We do have some indexes that you can check as well. You can also, I don't like to necessarily promote online databases over looking at what might be on microfilm in terms of an index, but especially right now during a pandemic, the online resources are what we really have to deal with and make use of. And if you can do a keyword search, you can, um, see what kind of hits you get. I'm trying to think, you can query by the port too on some of those websites. Because that's really, you don't want to, especially if the name is common, get a lot of results. You want to try to make it as finite as possible. So another thing too is if you look at some of those census records too, if they're a recent enough arrival, I would look at some of those census records and see if they give you a clue about when that person may have come into the country because that'll give you an idea of the time frame you're looking for for that date of arrival. And then like Rose was saying, you could look at a naturalization record because some of those flat out say exactly what ship they came on and the date of arrival. 
Oh, and it looks like we had a follow-up to that question too. In this case, it sounds like um, the there was inconsistent information between the declaration of intent uh, of attention and census records. They provide different years of arrival. Um, that can definitely happen. I know as certainly on census records, as Rebecca mentioned, um, people are recalling information sometimes many decades after the fact to report on it. Um, so you can find discrepancies like that and, and that can be um, a challenge, but at least it, it can, um, as Rebecca was mentioning, kind of give you a window in which to search. Sometimes it does just take browsing through the records. Um, it's long, it's tedious, but that's your most comprehensive way of, of finding something. I had a, an actual personal success story because my dad tells a family lore story and, and I look at family lore kind of like the game of, of telephone. So there's going to be a grain of truth in it, but then again, it's, it's retold by many generations. So, you know, his parents told it to him, then he tells it to me. And he kept telling that his grandmother came over, I think he said around the turn of the century. And he knew that she settled in Illinois and he knew where, so that was helpful. I finally found a passenger manifest. I think it was right around 1905. He was thinking, I think he kept telling me that she came through Boston and I could not find anything and the, the indexes were a little spotty. One day I just went online and started looking around Ancestry and tried looking her up. I found someone that really matched, because he was saying she was, I think probably like 17 or 18 when she came over and he kept saying she came with a friend. Sometimes if they're, if you know they're traveling with someone too, if you can look for that other person's name, you might be able to find the manifest. But in this case, um, I found her coming in through New York and it showed her destination. It was this little town in Illinois. So I'm almost certain that this is her. So it's kind of piecing together all those, those stories of family lore and, and, kind of whittling out what changed over time. What did somebody forget? What did somebody twist a little bit? Is this likely your ancestor? All right, so our next question, Sue had a question um, about one of the particular manifests that um, you showed Rebecca, that earliest one that had damage on it. Um, mm -hmm. We wanted to know what were the letters in the far left-hand side uh, what they stood for. There was abbreviations, um, FL, LK, W, things like that. Do you want me to bring I was it back up? Like a, get yeah, I was taking, I was taking a look, and it, it's it's hard because the the top heading of that column is unfortunately part of the record that was ripped off, so it doesn't um it doesn't, it doesn't give say. Help. But yeah, if you can bring that up. See if I can bring it back mm -hmm. up. Hold on one second. Uh, yeah. And while we're doing that, we'll we'll take a look at some other questions. So Karen asked, um, the first year that the U.S. issued passports. Um, so the first passport applications that we have, um, as I mentioned, were, were 1795. Um, it's it's pretty sparse on early, those early years, though, in terms of of what we have. Um, though, though to me, it's pretty also surprising um, the number of of people who who did travel um, back and forth um, in the in those years I don't know why I, I just imagine that people either came over and then never never left never moved around but there there was a lot of international travel and so yeah here we have this example Rebecca those letters on that left column you know what they stand yeah, for yeah it looks like our our column heading is gone we would almost have mm -hmm. to try to find this maybe we could find it online and try to see if like some of the other pages say what it is, but I, I don't know if it will or not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get left with some mysteries too. Yeah, unfortunately, but yeah, that's probably a good idea to check maybe the next next couple of pages. So, and Sue had another question: How do you do you know if there are immigration records that you have? that databases like Ancestry or Family Search don't yet have. Um, so there's a couple places you can check. Um, in terms of, of passenger arrival records on microfilm, um, you can check our microfilm catalog. Um, that is available from our, through our website, our, our research portal page. I'll, I'll submit the link in the chat box. Um, 
that you can go to and, and you'll just go to archives.gov slash research um, and then that'll give you a link to the microfilm catalog so you can search in there. Um, there's a also our main catalog, catalog.archives.gov has series level descriptions of um, virtually all of the records that we have in our holdings so you can check there too. Um, that can just be a little bit um, cumbersome to, to use sometimes because it has so many descriptions. So if ever you're in doubt um, that there might be something that, that you're not seeing on one of these databases, you can just always email us as well. Our catalog will also tell you if it's been reformatted. So a lot of times it will tell you mm -hmm. what microfilm publication it corresponds to. Um, sometimes there are some images of records that are available through the catalog and it'll have a a little virtual button that you need to click on to see those images. But it's still the, there's a case where not everything is described in the catalog because the National Archives has such fast holdings. And it, there's no way that we can possibly have everything digitized either because of the extent and volume of the records that we have. So uh, we had another question from Sue. What exactly is a Siemens Protection Certificate and what was its original purpose? Um, I believe that um, documentation was for uh, merchant mariners um, who were U.S. citizens um, and, and they were sailing around the world um, on, as part of their work. And the documentation was so that they could prove that, yes, they were U.S. citizens um, early on uh, so that they could prove that, no, they were not. British citizens, you can't conscript us into service. That was a big issue during um, the War of 1812. Um, but documentation for those those sailors um, who were back and forth in and out of ports all over the country. Um, wouldn't you say, Re Rebecca? That's what I would say. That's the impression. I haven't worked with them as much as the passports, but they're very similar to a passport ap application, but just for the seamen to identify who they are and that they are, in fact, a U.S. citizen, because especially when they're traveling during times of war, you don't want to not be able to come back to the United States. So Sue had another question. How do how did they proceed um, if they could not verify someone was on a particular ship or arrival record? I believe that's for the um, the naturalization paperwork or for the um, certificate arrival for the um, passport application. That must that must be what that question is for. Um, Let's go back. Can you pull that one up, Rebecca? Um, oh, that was um, Ellen. Um, the uh, Ellen Brosnan's. That's for her um, nationalization paperwork. Want me to pull so that if, one up? Um, yeah. So if they could not provide the the certificate um, because the information differed, um, Rebecca, do you know would they go back and um, they'd interview the person again and and try to resolve the discrepancy, or they would deny it outright? I'm trying been to remember if I've seen imagine. that they, I can't remember if I've seen them write that they were unable to find something. You know, one place that would be an excellent place to look is that manifest markings website that mm -hmm. we gave you a link to in the passenger arrival handout. That was written by, she's retired now, but at the time she was the United States Citizenship and Immigration services um, historian, and she teamed up with the Jewish Gen website and was able to post. And she has all kinds of interesting scenarios and complicated things related to passenger manifests on that web page. Let me see. Now I'm going to go try back and if I can find. And then while you're looking for that one, we had another question about um, Robert's certificate for naturalization. It said, what was um, cast in the right eye mean? Um, so that's a good question. It says um, on his certificate, um, his visible distinctive marks, he has a cast in the right eye. If you take a look at his picture, which we can pull that up in a second as well, um, it might be that they're, his eyes are different colors, so I don't know if he had a glass eye. I don't know if um, he had another um, had other damage to his eye, um, but we can take a look at that as well. So yes, here's um, if you click Rebecca, it'll bring the certificate of arrival forward. Um, and yeah, I can't think I've seen a, an instance in which they did not 
to certify it. No, I have mean, I have seen, seen in textual records when we get into the Immigration and Naturalization Service subject and policy files, you get cases in there where people get denied entrance into the United States. And then mm. that textual documentation will, will explain why. Mm. The only way to really get into those records about a specific individual would be to do that genealogy search through United States Citizenship and Immigration Services because they retain the name index. And then if they find something during the course of their index search, they'll write back to you and they'll tell you to contact the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. for an Entry 9 file, and they'll give you the file number with the caveat that some of those records no longer exist. So if they give you that number, it will be in a 50,000 range. We can, you can then write to the National Archives and provide us with that information, and our staff will check and tell you whether or not we have the file. So again, those are for, for if someone was um, denied entry um, originally. That can be something that we might have documentation of. Rebecca, if you'll scroll down to um, the certificate of naturalization, let's take a look at the, the cast in the right eye. Um, it I may be hard to too, see on the screen. Um, what if there was like a maybe, I mean, I'm just kind of theorizing with this, but like some kind of injury to the eye or an ulcer, yeah. something like That's that, that would good. make the eye look a little bit opaque. Mm -hmm. They're they're definitely definitely different colors. So that's that's our our guess. But some sometimes yeah you you, you wouldn't know otherwise. Um, with Robert, so another question we had um with Robert Morris um, when he sent the letter um for his passport application. This kind of goes hand in hand with the the second question um. What did Robert Morse's actual passport look like? And then what do other early passports look like? Um, and we don't really know, um, at least from, from our perspective at the National Archives, because we don't have the actual passports. Um, since those were um, given to the individual who applied, I mean, they, they hang on, hung on to those. But I, I, they're not, I imagine that they would not be the little booklets that we get today. Um, Rebecca, do you know what kind of format they would be in? Would it be just a, a letter? I'm, I'm thinking it may have been. Um, but mm -hmm. like you said, we typically do not have the passport itself. I have one of my colleagues, I haven't seen them yet. He, he needs to look back at some of his notes and tell me where these records are because they're part of the Immigration and Naturalization Service records. And there was a portion in there where there was some surrendered passports, I believe. I've yet to see them, so I'm not sure if they might be, they might be the booklets at that point. But I'm thinking for the really early ones, it's probably, probably just a single sheet of paper trying to think there was a book that was written not too long ago. Let me see if I can, um, I'm going to stop sharing and look a little bit. Okay. There was a, a person that was doing a research about passports. There may be, see, I have a really nice book on my bookcase in my office at work that I can't access right now. <laughs> so I got to see if I can find the title of the book, there may well be some pictures of passports in his book. Let me see if I can find it. I'm gonna look around a little bit. Yeah, there's probably um, sources you can you can find elsewhere um, related to those. And there's probably, it wouldn't necessarily be as easy to find, but um, some Department of State like policy documents would probably detail how they were to issue um, if, if actual passports. Um, that might just take some digging in actual Department of State records, though. So we have another question. Any idea of what percentage of the passenger manifests were preserved? Um, I would think that not all of them did. Um, so we have, um, we, Rebecca, as you're looking, um, we know of a few that um, didn't survive. Correct, isn't there? We have a, um, a list. I don't know if it's posted on our website of the microphone. 
Um, or the um, from the microphone reading room? I think. Sorry, I'm po posting something into the chat box. Okay. Oh, um, Sue Bennett um, searched on Google. Thank you, Sue. Um, found that cast in the eye is a squirt or that one eye deviates. Oh, interesting. Uh, oh. That would be, that would explain um, Robert Crawford's situation. Good point. So what, what I did is in the chat box, I shared the title and the author of a book that might have some possible images of the original passports. It's called The Passport in America, The History of a Document by Craig Robertson. So we're, 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 let's go back. I was doing a couple of things, so I wasn't fully paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, so passenger manifests and records that don't survive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're aware of, of some of them. Um, isn't that right? We have the um, we have a list in our microphone reading room. I don't know if that's on our. I'm sh it could be on our website. Um, we'd have yeah, to I'm not sure if down. it is on the. I know that we're definitely aware of a large portion of the end that there is no index for the New York arrivals for a very long period of time, but I don't think it's because they're missing. I think it's just an index was not created because it was probably a very time consuming undertaking. And of course, the, um, an important caveat is because our, um, Passenger manifests began in 1820. We're not aware of, of what um, necessarily records exist bef before that. I mean, that pretty, pretty, could be pretty spotty depending on the, the state. Um, that's a question for state archives. Um, but, yeah, I think, but if you email us, we can look further into, into that. And I think another situation that we run into with the passenger manifest is this happened a lot with a lot of the federal agencies is that you know, original records take up so much room, and especially those manifests, they were absolutely mm -hmm. huge in terms of the size of them. So what a lot of these agencies did was they microfilmed the originals, and then they destroyed the originals after that microfilm was published. And I think there's some very few exceptions where some of those original manifests still exist, but in most cases, all we have is the microfilm. So we treat the microfilm like it is the original record. So we had, um, we had another question about how to find out where someone was employed. Um, so Rebecca, Rebecca, I know you mentioned um, you can get an occupation from the census records, general occupation. Um, well, if they are, this is what I can speak most to because I work with federal records. So if they were a federal employee, starting in about 1920 on, they have official personnel files. So you would have to know, were they civilian employee? Like, did they work for the post office or the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Indian Affairs? or were they a military staff member? And then we have a National Personnel Records Center. Uh, let me send you the link through the chat. In terms of private employment, that can be, that can be challenging, um, at least, at least from, from our perspective, um, since we'll only have federal records. I mean, sometimes you can find information in an obituary Oh, they might say where somebody worked. Um, if you're if you're able to track down the information and the company still exists, they might have um, archives. Um, but it it can be sometimes um, challenging to to find um, specifically where where someone is employed. It would be something to take a look at in, in um, state or local records or, or records of the particular um, um, organization if you can if you can find it. Um, so let's see, we had another, speaking of discrepancies, I noticed, Ken said that I noticed Moses Kordinsky's passport application um, signed his name Kordinsky, um, the doctor typed Kordinsky, and the record is indexed under Kordinsky. So yes, you can, lots of, lots of name variations. Um, so actually, actually, that was great that Sue mentioned um, the book that she had 
for name changes, um, you had not only official name changes um, occurring when, when people came to the United States, but misspellings and when people misheard a name, they wrote it down wrong. Um, so it's always important to, to just keep in mind if you, you're searching for records on a particular spelling of a name, try a different one if you're not finding anything. Um, play around with the the, the spellings. Um, Rebecca mentioned wildcard searches. A lot of these websites um, with our digitized um, content can support wildcard searches. So you can, you can um, instead of typing in a particular letter, you can type in an asterisk um, and it'll, it'll um, find any results that have um, those combinations of, of letters. Um, so that can be, that can be an option for helping track down variations. So we've had, oh, thank you. Some, some um, folks have said thank you. So we're, we're really glad y'all came and, and are sticking with us too for, um, for this presentation. Um, so we had a, another question from Sue. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I shared the military personnel link to our National Personnel Record Center. Now I'm looking for the civilian and it, it, they're driven, so pay attention to them kind of closely. They're driven by the date that they, the individual stopped working for the, the federal government. So based on that separation date, we'll determine whether the record is deemed archival or non-archival. So there's slightly different places that you have to locate. Uh, to contact to request a copy of a record. And it looks like we have, um, while Rebecca's checking down that link, we have um, another question, were there Siemens protection certificates for countries other than the U.S.? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I would imagine there would be something similar that other countries would issue to their uh, seamen or merchant mariners for the same reasons that the U.S would issue documentation to our merchant mariners. Um, but since we just have um, records of the U.S. government, um, we probably wouldn't have that documentation. Um, that's something you could uh, reach out and contact other national archives um, about. But I don't think it'd be outside the realm of, realm of possibility. And it um, looks like that is all of the questions we have um, so far in, in the chat. Um, so looks, okay, Rebecca, you just found the found the link for civilian. The arc of all. Um, you know, Rebecca and Rose, I have a question. You know, um, about two years ago, because my class has been going on now for about three years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we did talk one in one class about two years ago. Uh, we highlighted the uh, federal employee uh, personnel files. And I think that is such an important topic that maybe we need to address that again in the future. Um, do you guys have a presentation put together on that topic? I do not, but what I used to do in my previous job is I worked with the records of genealog genealogical interest and we put on some virtual genealogy fairs. Mm -hmm. I know that there are some that are published online already. And if you wanted to get a live speaker, I think you would contact our St. Louis facility. I'll get you their email and put it in the chat. Great. Okay. Because they'll put you I in think, touch I with whoever class has. Would, I think my class would really be interested in that topic because, like I said, about two years ago, I did do a class on it, and I was amazed at how much information is in those old federal employee uh, personnel files. Yes, I'm trying to think. I know one of the ladies, I think, went to a different agency, but one of them, I think, is still around. I think probably the best thing would be to write to their their general inbox, and then they'll put you in touch with someone. Okay. I'm going to look for that real quick, but let me get, uh, let's see, official. this one. I have a question about your genealogy lab, Sue. Uh -huh. So during this pandemic where I am especially looking for training opportunities for our staff, do you allow people from the public to join in? Meaning could oh. the National Archive staff come to some of your webinars? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have an email list and anybody who wants to be on my email list, 
uh, just 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 feel free to give out my email address and uh, I'll just put them on. Yeah, I have a lot of people um, who are not you know regular attendees who some of them are even out of state. Uh, now we didn't normally used to do that uh, when we were strictly in the classroom. Uh, right. And I'll tell you why, because, you know, if, obviously if everybody could do it from home all the time, nobody would ever come to the you know, actual classroom. And I have to keep the, you know, the classroom filled in order to, uh, you know, be able to keep that room. Um, so I always kind of, uh, uh, try, you know, try to keep people from not wanting to log in from home. However, when the COVID-19 situation happened, you know, the whole school went online in a matter of days. You know, we had to take yes. all the classes that were in the classroom on to completely virtual. Uh, however, it has been so successful, to be honest with you, uh, since we went online, my, my attendance on a weekly basis has actually gone up. So I talked it over with my boss and she said, you know what, even when we go back into the classroom, uh, you know, we might as well continue on with you know, doing it virtually. So absolutely feel free to give out my email address. Um, I do, you know, let everyone know who wants to join the email list. I do send out three emails each week. I send out a, an email Friday morning telling everybody uh, who our guest speaker is going to be that day and what the topic is going to be along with the link to click into the live feed webinar and then on Wednesday morning uh, of the following week I send out a genealogy book of the week uh, before the COVID-19 virus hit um, our book of the week was always a paper book that we had in our genealogy collection in our library uh, but now that um, you know the library is closed I switched it over to an e uh, an ebook of the week uh, and the way we got around that, uh, because normally with our ebook subscriptions, um, you, know, you have to be a student uh, of our school or an employee of our school in order to access it. But like all libraries all across the country, they are working with their vendors uh, to open things up temporarily at least. Uh, so, you know, people who are stuck at home have access. So we were able to get community access to our ebooks at least temporarily uh, until the virus thing, you know, uh, settles down. Uh, so, you know, that would be the Wednesday email and then usually around Monday or Tuesday of the, the, the week after the, the presentation, like today you did your presentation, I'll be sending out the recording uh, in my what I call my okay. links used on Monday and Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, depending on how quickly our IT department gets me the link and that goes out to, you know, so they can rewatch it again. And then we also post the webinars now on our school YouTube channel. Uh, so, you know, absolutely. Uh, in fact, if anybody wants to out there in the audience, I, I see we only have 26 people still logged in right now. Um, but if, if you're not aware, uh, the T, if you go to YouTube, type in TMCC, uh, the TMCC YouTube channel will come right up and then you just click on playlist and it gives you the option to look at genealogy. And we now, uh, as of this week, we have 16, the last 16 weeks worth of recordings in there. Uh, so if anybody wow. wants to rewatch them, you know, uh, you can always do that as well. But the answer is yes. That was like a, a long answer to a short question, but absolutely. Um, we, we are kind of taking this, you know, more than just out, you know, in our community like it used to be. Yeah, it's definitely a very strange time. So we're, we're looking because like you, we literally closed down in a moment's notice. So I came in on a Monday and by that afternoon, I knew I was going home until full, further notice. So we had to try to scoop up as much work as we could and now we're having to get a little inventive so it would be great if we can continue to learn while we're virtual 100 percent teleworking and Absolutely. this is exciting and I, and I gotta i gotta share with you um and i've been sharing this with my students in my weekly emails there are so many free online genealogy learning opportunities right now especially since the covid 19 thing hit um, a lot of the genealogy websites have really stepped up. Uh, my Heritage is a really good example. Family Search is a great example. Uh, and if you're on my email list, all those those links I, I send out to my class every week because I'm encouraging everybody why you are home, why not take advantage of free learning opportunities? Um, you know, it seems like with genealogy, especially, you know, we never have enough time, you know, uh, under normal circumstances to do our genealogy research. But now that we're all stuck at home and we really cannot go outside or very limited opportunities to go outside, uh, we most certainly, you know, uh, hopefully can take that extra time and, and uh, make it a learning opportunity. Definitely, we make the lemons into lemonade. <laughs> yeah, I've taken a lot of webinars since I've been stuck home, you know, and, and I tell you, it's a real growth opportunity and especially for free. Like I said, so many vendors are now, you know, what they used to charge for for webinars are now offering them for free. Yeah, because I've been watching some of the professional either archival or records keeping um, organizations and a lot of them are either opening up the training free 
to everyone or sometimes if we are already a member, we can participate in that. So I'm, I've been trying to compile some of these sources for us and then I share resource because you're you're getting speakers about all kinds of different topics yeah and I, I'm right now I'm booking all the way out to August my first available booking is now in August you have full books <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that that's better to to have an abundance of speakers well, you know, I think I think having a different topic each week actually is beneficial to the, the people in attendance um, because, you know, I think learning the same thing, like if you're only learning, you know, German genealogy every week, it might get, you know, a little a little boring. Uh, but having a different topic each week kind of, I think, makes it the variety kind of nice. Yes, yeah, so, and I'm interested, too, because if you're doing some non-federal records, if some of your speakers are talking about that topic, we get questions about anything and everything. So part of our job is not only knowing about the holdings of the National Archives, but sometimes we have to kind of problem solve and figure out what is a state or local or even an international resource for records. Yeah, I only wish we'd started putting our, our videos our, of our guest speakers on the YouTube channel earlier. Unfortunately, uh, the opportunity just didn't come until the first week of January of this year. And uh, um, our IT department and our marketing department offered to help me with it because, you know, up till now, it's pretty much just been me, you know, running the, the program. Um, but now that I have a little extra help, um, you know, better things are happening because, you know, having those extra departments assisting me has really made a big difference. That does. I mean, things start to really grow and take off. So there are some positive spins to looking at things a little differently than we normally would day to day. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I think um, it, we're just about ready to run out of recording time because it, it's set to turn off at two o'clock. So <laughs> anyhow, I'm going to say thank you both. Um, it, it's been wonderful. And we, you know, I know we had really great attendance today um, that we had 48 people at the, at the peak of the sign-ins. Uh, so that, that's a that's a very nice number to have for class today. So um, I'm going to say thank you. And um, I will be in touch with you with the link to the recording probably by Monday or Tuesday of next week. And um, as always, as I tell all my guest speakers, if you'd like to present again uh, on a different topic, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you back. And you can email me and let me know that. Oh, and also, I definitely thank you for do have us. other. Oh, I'm sorry. I definitely have other topics, um, just not the personnel files, but I can look through and see what I've done in the past. Oh, that would be wonderful. That would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, and then also, uh, if you know of anybody uh, out there in the genealogy related fields that would be interested in presenting, feel free to pass on my contact information. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you so Sue. much we for really having appreciate us. it. Okay, now my class can't clap because you can't see them, but I'm going to clap for them. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I will go ahead and all everybody has to do to sign out is just click on that red hang up button. Oh, oh one last thing. Um, is it okay if they email you directly if my students have a question? They can. Um, sure, feel free. You want us to put our, you have our emails. Do you want to share it that way? Yeah, I, I, I just as long as it's okay, I will go ahead and put it in the weekly email that I send out next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I know that sometimes we may not be able to answer everything at the moment, uh, depending on what we have access to or not. But sometimes if it's a little bit more of a general question, we might be able to give an answer. Okay, that, that's great. I just didn't want to give out anyone's email without asking first. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, and then also I wanted to say thank you for allowing us to record today. It's much appreciated. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. Well, then I will say thank you, and I will ask everyone to go ahead and just click on the red hang up button, and I will still stay online if you need some one-on-one -on -one help after the class ends. Um, I'm on payroll today until 5 o'clock. So um, just shoot me an email and I will go ahead and set up a Zoom session and work with you one on one if anyone's interested. Hey, have a good day. I'm going to sign off. All right. All right thank you. All right. Thank you, Sue. Bye bye.